God bless you. you. May be seated. It's wonderful to be together again this morning. And if there's something that keeps presenting itself in people's lives, it is anxiety. And we want to escape anxiety and just have the peace of God in every area of our lives and, and know that God has a plan and purpose for us. And he is working out his plan. He's working out his purpose. And it is well. Amen. You know, sometimes people just keep saying it as a cliche, it is well. It's not about saying to people it is well. It's about knowing it. In your knower, it is well. Because people can say, oh, it's well, just to keep you off from going any, any further. But it's not just about saying it's well. It's about knowing it is well. And that God is in total control. In our Bible reading plan, we are in Genesis. And I uh, have gone ahead and I'm looking at uh, Jacob. And I want us just to read some verses there. Genesis chapter 32. I'm going to read from verses 24 to 30. The key verse is verse 24. And it says, Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Now, we're looking at anxiety. What does your anxiety do? Well, anxiety does not keep you from experiencing evil. It makes, as a matter of fact, you incapable of coping with what is to come. It messes you up big time. Anxiety does not bless your tomorrow. What it does is that it curses today. And our Lord has, has given to us the power to bear all the bur burdens that he's making because God allows things to happen. But he gives us the power and the ability to bear whatever comes our way. He will never put on us more than we are able to bear. And the burdens that we bear of ourselves is of our own making. And it comes mostly from our, ang our anxiety. We put that on ourselves. All our worrying, all our, our anxieties. And we see here that Jacob had spent uh, a night of anxiety. And, and, and if we look at what Jacob went through, we can gain some uh, insights from him and, 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 and find out how to actually overcome and how to escape anxiety. Because Jacob was a man who was actually riddled with anxiety. So first of all, let's look at some of the reasons for anxiety. Why do people torture themselves <laughs> with the... The, 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 the kind of vicious tool of anxiety. I, I, I am a person that's, that came from that place. I used to be anxious about all sorts of things, so anxious I couldn't sleep at night, my stomach all knotted up, cold sweats, just anxious. So when I talk about this, I know what I'm talking about, but I also know you can overcome it. I also know you can escape it if you put your faith and confidence completely in God. Why do we actually subject ourselves to this 
this senseless tension, this inner turmoil. I mean, it, it, can, it can even prevent you from eating your food, from enjoying a good meal. It can mess you up big time. If you get anxious, you can't eat. And Jacob experienced anxiety, and we see that, that, the, that his experience of anxiety actually reveals three, four things to us. First of all, the first thing we see with Jacob is loneliness. Jacob was left alone. We see that in verse 20. Four. He was left alone. Now he had, all, he had his wives, he had all his children, he had all his servants, he had left Laban, but he was left alone. And it's not always good to be alone. There are times when it's, you know, it's good to be alone, to be alone with the Lord and so on. But God didn't make us to be people to live alone, to be islands on our own. We're meant to be with, um, with people. So Jacob, he was already disturbed. And he was left alone in this situation and he felt the cruel grip of anxiety. It laid hold of him. And anxiety has an affinity with loneliness. If the enemy can isolate you and get you on your own, then he can start pouring on all the reasons why you should be anxious, all the stuff that's going on in your life. He can bring back all the things from the past. You see, with, if you're with people and you're, you're distracted, you're, you're in a different zone altogether. But if he can get you on your own, then he starts piling it up. You start going back into the past. He starts digging things up. He starts accusing you. He starts making you feel bad about things that you did in your past. And, 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 and this loneliness, it, 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 it breeds, it, 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 gets, it makes things worse if you stay in that place. It's fertile soil. I mean, God even said when he saw uh, Adam, he said, it's not good for man to be alone. He knew it wouldn't be good for Adam to spend all his life alone. And what the devil does, he tries to, to bring all the negative things that we can see. So you can be, you can be with a group of people, and you could be in that group and doing things, but then the devil starts to, to, to try to isolate you, even though you're in the midst of people. My dad once told me a story about some cows, how the enemy can attack us. There were some cows and they were in a field and they were chewing the cud together and they were enjoying each other's company and there was a wolf who wanted to eat the cows. And so what he had to do in order to destroy them was to isolate them. So as these cows were eating together in, in, in the meadow, he, 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 the wolf looked at them very, very very carefully. And he saw that there was one cow that moved slightly away from the others. And that doesn't have to mean it was a, a negative reason he moved away, but he must have, you know, saw grass on the other side was a little bit greener, so he moved away. And the wolf said, I got you. All I've got to do is get you completely away. And so as the cow moved further away, he came alongside the cow. And he said to the cow, you see them too? See how far away they are from you? They've moved away from you. You think you've been having fellowship with them. And you think they're nice, but they're actual hypocrites. They don't like you. They don't care about you. Started feeding the cow negative information. The cow looked up at the other two cows and saw, yes, they were away from him. But they didn't move from him. He moved from them. He said, it's true. It's absolutely true. They can't possibly like me. And the wolf began to feed and feed him with negative thoughts, he became more and more anxious. He began to dislike the other two cows for what reason I do not know. But moved well away from the other two cows and then the wolf devoured him. 
That's what the enemy does to us. He lies to us. He tries to isolate us. He puts us in a place where we feel lonely, unloved, unappreciated, but it's all about trying to destroy us. He builds these, the feeling of anxiety. He feeds into it. And many of us, many of us, we buy into it. But we've got to understand that God is our God. He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. And God is, we are not incompetent. God has made us competent people. And God wants us to enjoy what he has for us and fulfill his purpose for our lives. He wants us to enjoy the fertile soil he's put us in. He wants to feed us by his own divine hands. What the enemy wants to do is starve us and destroy us. You are loved. You are loved. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, you are loved and you are not alone. What loneliness does, it renders us incompetent for life's great tasks. And Moses was aware of this fact because he said in Numbers eleven fourteen, 14, he says, I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. God had called Moses to lead his people, but God was going to lead his people through Moses. And Moses felt he had to do all the leading himself. And he said, you know, as, as I stand here as one man leading these people, the burden is just too great for me. Sometimes the enemy makes you feel that you're so alone, your position, your post is such an isolating post that you, you can't function. He wants to render you dysfunctional. And what did God say to him? God's solution for Moses was to surround himself with 70 elders to help him. He said, okay, Moses, if you feel that way, then call 70 elders and let them help you carry the burden. If you feel isolated, it's not about saying, oh, I've got to bear all this on my own. No, God will equip you with people to help you. So you don't run away, you run to God and God will give you the solution. God, this is how I'm feeling. And we have to learn not to be governed by our feelings because our feelings can be so wrong. And what the enemy likes to do is live in our feelings. Keep you in that place where you, 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 you're all caught up in your own feelings. And I can tell you most of the time, our feelings are wrong. And how many times, well, I had this feeling, or I've got this feeling. And then you start following the feeling. You follow the feeling, the devil will cut you down. Our feelings are mostly wrong. We have two good eyes, most of us. I mean, you can see, you're not blind, but you can't even follow your own sight. You can't follow your feelings. But God is in control and we have to allow him to lead and direct us. For those who are at Ashburnham, there's a tremendous teaching that um, Pastor took those through yesterday. I was just there for, for yesterday about being a, 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 um, a soldier in the army of the Lord and God raising up an army and looking at core values. We have to address those things and know what our core values are because if we do not know what our core values are, anxiety will come to the forefront and anxiety will destroy us and render us incapable of doing what God will have us to do. Another thing about loneliness is that it removes us from the source of encouragement and strength. Ecclesiastes chapters. Uh, four. I'm going to read some verses from there. Verses nine. It's really actually verse ten, but verse nine to get the context. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. 
For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Try not to isolate yourself. Two is better than one. God's placed you amongst people. God's given you a family, a, a natural family, a spiritual family. Don't allow the enemy to bring you to a place where he wants to isolate you and feel lonely because then he's going to take you out. You know, if something happens, there's no one there to help you. God wants us to help each other, to bear one another's burdens. What the devil tries to do is find everything he can to separate us. And going back to the idea of a soldier being in, 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 in an army, they can't fight alone. You have, if you're going to win the battle, you have to fight together. And you have to understand, you don't pick which battalion you are in. God's put you in a battalion. And for some reason, the devil starts telling you junk. And you decide, I don't want to be in this battalion. You can't just pick up yourself and go to another uh, battalion and say, I'm joining you. It doesn't work like that. These soldiers learn to gel. They know each other. They get to know each other. They're going, they're going through training. They train together. They get to know each other's habits. They know each other's strengths. They know each other's weaknesses. And they're able to compensate for each other. And if someone is one falls, the other covers their backs. But what the enemy is trying to do, especially in this end time, God has placed us and God has planted us where he wants us to be. And the devil knows we are going to be effective where we are if we endure the course of training. You have to endure the course. And so what the enemy does, he shows us reasons why we shouldn't be a part of the battalion that God's put us in. Listen, God had a purpose for Jacob's life. But Jacob had to come in line with God's purpose. It's not about how we feel or what we want or who we choose to be around us. It's God's purpose. It's where he's planted us, the the road he's put us on, the journey he's traveling with us, and the destination that he is going to take us to. And we don't understand everything because God doesn't tell us everything. He can't tell us everything. If he told us everything, we'd scarper. He can't tell us everything. But what we have to do is trust him. Have confidence in him. And know he's going to bring us out all right. Know he's working all things out for our our good. Another thing that loneliness does apart from removing the, the, our source of encouragement, what it also does, it, it, it develops a spirit of self-pity. And that spirit of self-pity intensifies anxiety. There was a man, a great man of God. You can say he's a great man of God. Elijah. He was, he was guilty of inflicting anxiety upon himself. God had given him a great victory. God had shown himself strong and mighty. God had turned Israel around, removed all the the false worshippers and the the false prophets and brought the people to a place where they would declare, we will serve God. God actually, he he led people to, 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 to challenge their own belief systems. When they called upon the false gods from morning to night, nothing happened. And when he just called upon God, God 
consumed the, the sacrifice. A sacrifice had been drenched with water. The flames came, and the people knew who was God. And on the height of all of that, there comes this woman, Jezebel, and he knows Jezebel's na nature. He knows what she's all about, but she says, I'm going to kill you. But he knows the power of God. He knows how God proved himself strong and mighty. But what gets into his head is the fact that Jezebel wants to kill him. He, forgot, he forgets all about God and how big and mighty God is and how much control God has and all that God's done, that God even turned the people around and back to him. And he, he runs for his life. And he's filled with anxiety and self-pity. He convinces himself that he's the only one that loves God. He is the only one that's going to stand for righteousness. He is the only one who's there for God. And it's a big lie. What I said to you last week, the devil's a liar. And we've got to stop believing his lies. And God feeds him, sends ravens to feed him. God takes care of him. He lets him rest and sends him on his journey. But, I, uh, but he, he, Elijah is so fixed on himself. And that's why anxiety has lots of ground to run on if we're fixed on ourselves and what we feel and what we think. Let's read um, 1 Kings 19. Verses 9 to 11. And he says, and there he went into a cave. So he's moved now from, from where he was, having been fed with ravens, and God's moved him on. And so he, he, he then he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Anxiety gets us in a place that we shouldn't be. Now, God knows why he's there, but God wants him to know why he's there. What are you doing here, Elijah? And so he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. Now they've they come back to God, haven't they? He's seen them turn around. He says, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left and they seek to take my life. And then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And it's that first part of verse 11 that I want. Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Get up from where you are. Go out. Get out from the place you are, that place of self-pity and that place of misinformation that's wrecking your life, get up, get out, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. Wherever you are right now, whatever's going on in your life and however you feel, get up from that place. Come out of that cave. Go out. And stand before the Lord. Move from that place of loneliness. If, with, if you're with God, you cannot be lonely. Because you know if you're with him, you're never alone. But you're going to get out from the cave that you put yourself in. Because you believed lies. God's not going to come and drag you out. So don't pray, God, you know, if, if this is not the place you want me to be, take me out. No, 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 no. What you need to go is stand before God. Stand before God. And say, God is how I see myself. But you show me yourself. When I see you then I will see myself. Hallelujah. And he had to get up. And he came out of the cave. He came out of the cave of self-pity. And, and listen, 
as he came out of that place, he withdrew from self-pity and God repositioned him, got him back on track to be his spokesman. And God tells him what he wants him to do. He, God shows him, you're not to trust yourself, you've got to trust me. And I'm going to use you. And God tells him what he's got to do. He tells him, go and anoint this person king. He tells, he tells him exactly what to do. You need to come out of that cave right where you are today. This is the beginning of a new year. You've been in that cave all last year. It's time to come out that cave. You are in the army of God. You're a soldier. There's a, there's a battle to be fought and won. And God's called you to be a soldier. And you've got to come out the cave and declare yourself before God. Hallelujah. And so as Elijah got up, God showed himself. God was not in the wind and the fire and all the noise. God was there in a still, small voice. That still, gentle voice. His anxiety was stilled. His vision was renewed. And his trust was back in God. And he left that cave and entered into victory, doing what he was born to do. So much so that Elijah did not see death. That's what the Bible says. God sent his chariots to take him up. So we can mess up big time with anxiety, but when we come out of that cave... <laughs> In, in whatever cave it is, and we see God for who God really is, and you know who God really is, you go on to be everything that God wants you to be, and you excel, but you even break the boundaries of humanity. And his servant saw this man who had been filled with anxiety and stuff, so transformed by God, that he asked his servant, what do you want me to do for you? He said, I want a double portion of your anointing. <laughs> See what God can do? What God can do if we, if we escape our anxieties and our fears, which was to bring us into a place of unbelief and take away our confidence in God? He said, all I want is a double portion of what you have. And he says, if you see me, if you, that means if you keep your eyes on God and you follow God's way, God's going to give you the desire of your heart. And Elisha kept his eyes on Elijah. He wouldn't take his eyes off of him. Even when he said on errands, he had his eyes on him. And he saw he was being caught up and he caught the mantle. And that man, Elisha, caught the mantle. And he was a man that never suffered with anxiety or he never suffered with depression. He was never sad. He was never defeated. He was a man that had the victory. Yeah. When God deals with our lives and people see what he's done in our lives, it will take people to the next level. Yeah. Hallelujah. I thank God for his word. So God told Elijah Go out and stand on the mountain before God. He's saying to us right now, where we find ourselves, if it's not in a good place, stop criticizing people. Stop pulling people down. Stop saying they're hypocrites, they're this and they're that. Stop it. Because that's, that's exactly what Elijah did. And he's a man who was used by God. No one else loved God like him. No one else was right but him. 
And it got him in a place of loneliness and anxiety that made him lose his vision. God help us. Another cause for anxiety can be some past transgression. Going back to Jacob. Jacob could never forget the underhanded way in which he treated his brother. He took advantage of his brother in a moment of weakness. Let's, let's recap Genesis 25. Let's read 29 to 33. It says, now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, please feed me with that same red soup, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I am about to die. So what is this birthright to me? Now, in the moment, a birthright was a big thing, a a major thing. But when he compared having a birthright and being starving, so hungry to death, for him, the birthright meant nothing. God help us. Let's get our priorities right because we're going to mess up big time. What is a birthright to me? I'm hungry. So then Jacob said, swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Jacob knew what he did was wrong. He knew he'd taken advantage of his brother. And this was constantly in Jacob's mind. Esau moved on, he moved on, but Jacob could not forget it. He transgressed against his brother. Let's uh, look at um, Genesis 27, 18 to 24. It says, so he went to his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? This is uh, the father speaking. And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done just as you told me. Please arise, sit and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? And he said, because the Lord, and Lord is capital letters, your God brought it to me. And Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, whether you are really my son Esau or not. So something's going on. I just blind, you see, but something's not ringing right. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, and he felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. The father's blind. He hears the voice of Jacob, but he knows how his son Esau feels. So his senses mess him up. He knows he doesn't sound right, but he knows he feels right. So he blesses him. Jacob knows he has deceived his father. Let's look at 27, 34 to 35. Then Esau heard the words of his father. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me also. Oh, my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. He was deceitful. Now, Jacob can't forget his own deceit. When you do wrong, you cannot forget you've done wrong. And what will happen is that transgression will torment you. Even when God's willing to forgive you or God has forgiven you, even when other people have forgiven you and moved on, you are tormented. And that torment brings anxiety. So he was constantly anxious filled with anxiety because of that past transgression that plagued him day 
and night. And our past sins are a way of haunting us. It's in our consciousness. So it haunts our consciences. Uh, and, and it brings a fear of exposure because you're always afraid of being found out. And that person is so pitied because that person will not forgive themselves. You've got to forgive yourself of every past wrong. And you can forgive yourself if you confess your wrong. Confess your sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us. Deal with it. The amount of people that are tormenting other people because of their own sins. Because of their own deceit. They're trying to make people think there's something they are not. When all you've got to do is confess you did wrong, get it out. Look, listen, have no skeletons in the closet. I, I, I live in peace. And I'll tell you why I live in peace. Because if I've done something and it's been pointed out to me that it's wrong, and I realize I'm, I'm wrong, I will admit it. I, I'll just say... I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. I, I'll actually tell you. I'm imperfect, and I can make mistakes, and we all make mistakes. And I'll ask for forgiveness, and I'll move on. I am not going to argue with you. I'm not going to bring up all kinds of what I call evidence to prove to you that I'm right. I will not be wrong and strong. I'll back down. Now, my brother took the people last evening that to, to argue with his sisters is a waste of time. I've always been like that from a child. I shut my mouth. And I'll tell you why I shut my mouth and I don't say anything because you live to regret it. Now, I want to remind my brother today <laughs> why I keep my mouth shut. I'm going to remind him. When we were young, <laughs> grr, it's dangerous having family <laughs> in ministry. He was the only boy, as he always tells people. He had four sisters, one boy. But he was such a nuisance. <laughs> I'm the eldest, so I was always mummy's little helper. I learned early in life to be a compliant child. He's nice. So I was, most, most of the time, I'm not perfect, so I won't say all of the time, most of the time, <laughs> compliant. Dennis always liked to push the boundaries. If mommy or daddy said something, he want to know how far he can go without getting a walloping. So what he always used to do is aggravate the sisters. Because the one thing he had as a covering is that you have to understand he's the only boy. <laughs> And one day, he wanted me to get into trouble. Mummy told me to do something. And I said to my mum, I would do it in a minute. <laughs> then he said, Mummy, you told her to do it now. <laughs> mummy didn't say anything. But he kept on and on. So now mummy's the parent. And so she says, Rosie, do it now. Now I'm getting angry because I'm going to do it. But how dare he push mummy to make me do it now? He went on and on until mummy said, Rosie, get up and do it now. Well, I was in a rage. But remember, I don't talk. So it's bottling up inside. <laughs> so when we went, I went to get away from the whole situation. 
I went downstairs to do what I was supposed to do. Down comes Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> he won. As far as she's concerned, he won. Well, at that time, we had a separation between the kitchen and the dining room, and there was a glass door. All I wanted was to get Dennis away from me. Because if he came any closer, <laughs> he would see who the big sister is. <laughs> so I went into the kitchen to close the door, and he came on the other side to pull the door, and I took my fist and sent my fist through the glass door, and the whole thing <laughs> shattered. The whole... So you can imagine the amount of force. Thank God it was the door that took it and not him. I don't know if he'd be alive today. <laughs> but in that moment, the entire door smashed. Mummy heard the noise, the commotion. Now, Dennis is paralyzed in shock. So he's just standing there. I'm still standing there with my fist like that, shocked. And down comes Mummy. I look up at Mummy and I go, I said to myself, oh, I'm dead. <laughs> I'm dead. To myself, I'm dead. And my mum looks at my fist, still there, looked at the glass on the floor, looked back at me, and said, Rosie, you better pray that God takes away this temper that you have inside of you. For this to happen, you've got a bad temper. She said, Rosie, pray. Because today it's a smashed door. Only God knows what it will be tomorrow. Jesus. I put my hand down. I stepped over the glass. I went to the chair. And I sat down. And I began to cry. And I said, God, I asked you to take away this temper that manifested itself in this way. And I said, Lord, I ask you to help me for as long as I live to keep my mouth shut and control my temper. So that's why I don't get into arguments. Especially with me. <laughs> I shut my mouth. I'll say what I have to say, and then I shut my mouth. Because the talking back and forth can lead me to lose my soul. And so I've learned a discipline from that experience when I was 16 years old. And I'm now a matured woman. You can rein in your temper and you can change if you give it, whatever it is, to the Lord. I gave that thing to God. And from that day to this day, that's never happened again. All I do is I send you to Coventry. So get this. If you're talking to me and I'm not answering you and I refuse to answer you, remember, you're in Coventry. <laughs> but what the enemy does, what the enemy does is that he takes these transgressions that we don't deal with. Do you, do, are you following me? Yes. Do you understand? What I'm saying to you is, I brought that out and I dealt with it. And I can use it to help somebody else. But what a lot of people do is they don't deal with these things. And the enemy can make you anxious because you're hiding something that should have been dealt with. And if it had been dealt with, You'll be living in the victory today. 
Now, this is a new year. I don't know what we have for this year ahead of us. But one thing I do know, God puts things in my spirit. And I'm just sharing with you what God's put in my spirit. But I'm preaching to myself first. When I get a message, it's to me first. So don't anyone think, oh, she's pointing a finger. I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. I am just delivering what God's given to me. But it's applied to my life first. And I know it works. We are in an army. God's told Remick Bush to build an army, and God's building an army, and you're in this place because God selected you. And don't dare run from where God's put you unless God puts you out, tells you to go somewhere else, and places you somewhere else. We've got to be able to know how to escape anxiety, deal with the things that need to be dealt with. People have feel anxiety because of the threat of judgment. When the, when the messenger returned after Jacob had gone and worked uh, with Laban and all that, and now he's going to meet his brother. He says, after the messenger returned, when he reported that Esau was coming to meet Jacob, because Jacob leaves Laban. I'm trying to cut the story short because it's, it's just the highlights I want to bring out of the story. He's, he's going to meet his brother. He, he's, he's going back now, back to where he should be. He's taken everything with him, his wives, his children, his servants, his cattle. He's going back. But you see, this is, a, this is something, it, it's this transgression that he did against his brother and the deceit that he used on his father has to be dealt with so that he can enter into what God has for him. And so what has happened is he's sure, he's convinced himself that his brother is going to judge him and deal with him in the way he deserves because what he did was wrong. And so when it's reported that Esau's coming to meet Jacob and he's coming with 400 men, Jacob was actually afraid. I believe he was petrified. Genesis 32, 6 to 8. Then the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he also is coming to meet you and 400 men are with him. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. Now, Esau was moved on. He didn't have the birthright, but he's not suffering. He's actually in a good place. He's in such a good place that he's forgiven his brother. But Jacob is in the same place because he never dealt with his transgressions. You getting it? So you could be upset with people and you could be raging and in the same place and the very people you've wronged have moved on because they're enjoying the blessings of the Lord. They've forgotten it. They've got over it. And as a matter of fact, they're looking at you different. So they're loving you and you can't see it. God wants to set somebody free because you're in a place of torment when you should be doing God's business. You should be in that army doing what God's called you to do, positioned, knowing what you're meant to be doing and focus on what you're meant to be doing instead of carrying rubbish. Esau wants to bless his brother. He's so, he's so happy that they're going to reconnect. But Jacob is in such a bad place because he never dealt with his transgression. He never asked for forgiveness. He never forgave himself. And although God obviously has forgiven him for what he's done, because God's blessed him. Oh, God. The man is so blessed. Everything Jacob touched is like it turned to gold. Jacob's rich, 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 rich. But he can't see the blessings because he never dealt with the transgression and the anxiety of it. Every day is killing him. My God help us. 
stop us. And so when the servant says Esau's coming and he's coming with 400 men, of course he's thinking, he's coming to annihilate me. He's coming to wipe me out for stealing the birthright. Listen to me, Esau, move on from that birthright long time. There was no point Esau holding that in his heart. He went to his father. He said, Father, bless me. And the father said, I I can't bless you the way you want. I've already blessed Jacob. And so Esau had to come to understanding that there's no point begging the father for what he gave away. He gave it away. He treated it lightly. He didn't respect it. He sold it for a morsel of lentil soup. He realized it was his fault. So Esau did not put the blame on Jacob. Jacob was able to deceive him because he didn't hold dear what was precious. So Esau dealt with it, forgave himself for his stupidity, and moved on. God help us. God help us. And so he's coming to bless his brother, restore the relationship, and Jacob is afraid. He's he's actually afraid that Esau is going to kill him, that Esau is going to judge him, and and, and he knows he's going to get what he deserves. He's he's thinking he's going to get the severest judgment from Esau because he stole from Esau what was rightfully his. So what he does, he separates, makes two companies, and says, I'm going to fool you, Saul. You see, you see, see what anxiety does? Anxiety does not stop. Anxiety makes you scheme and connive even further. I'm going to separate two companies so, all right, half will go this way, and half will hide over there, and half will I'll steal the other half. So when he comes, if he kills me, and he kills off what's with me, the others will live. Listen to me. Oh, gosh. All, 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 all the pressure of, of having a game plan, a backup plan, when God's got the excellent plan, when God's got him to be a leader, When God's going to be a leader of the nations, when God's going to take him and give him everything that is his, when through his line, oh Jesus, we just lose the plot, don't we? It's it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. We totally lose the plot. He was he was anxious because of the threat of judgment. He was anxious because of the fear of the unknown. The Bible tells us that Jacob spent a sleepless night because he feared what tomorrow might bring upon him. And 95% of our worries are either about past events, which we can't change, or about future events that never materialize. (laughs) Have you been there? Have you lost sleep worrying about something you can't change? Yes. And have you lost sleep about worrying about how something's going to turn out the next day? And you get through the next day, and it never happened the way you thought you were Oh, I could have slept last night. <laughs> it does not materialize. We've got to escape anxiety. We've got to run from it. When we see it coming, kick it out. Don't let it take root because it's going to bring destruction. The results of anxiety, it brings needless worry. As we read in, in, in in Genesis 36, in verse 7 it says, Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people. And that's the the worst thing. It was needless because the worst didn't come. Totally the opposite. What worry does is it complicates life's problems. 
A problem can be relatively simple. But what happens is, as we worry, we make it bigger. All Jacob needed was reconciliation with his brother that he'd wronged. And that's all that Esau wanted, reconciliation. But Jacob worried day and night because it appeared to him as an unsolved problem. Someone wisely said, worry is interest paid on trouble before it's due. That's deep. Worry is interest paid on trouble before it is due. And it's unbecoming of a Christian. Psalms 55, 22 we read, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Make this a memory text. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. You are the righteousness of God. If you are in Christ Jesus, it does not matter what you have done in the past. The blood of Jesus has covered it all. Free yourself from anxiety. What a wonderful promise. Cast your burden on the Lord. He will, he will, he will sustain you. And he shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Stand your ground. The battle's already fought and already won at Calvary. Hallelujah. Another thing is, the results of anxiety, it makes you do these feverish works. Always doing works, always doing works. Spending so much time building up works. Genesis 32, 4 to 5. Then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. No, 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 no. No, that's not the right one. But, okay, we'll come back to that in a minute. Previous works. And that's what Jacob did. He worked for Rachel. He worked for Leah. He he, he accumulated so much money, but it didn't, it didn't ease the anxiety. All the years, it didn't ease the anxiety. All the years, it didn't, it didn't deal with what was inside of him. And here he is, want to give everything he's got, well, half of what he's got, because he's he's separated (laughs) It separates the company, still still a a conniver, Uh, to his brother to appease his wrongdoing. That's what anxiety causes us to do. It gets us into this feverish working to to escape facing the real issue that's that's really bugging us. So you keep on doing things, doing good, doing the da 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 lots and lots of busy, 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 busy. You don't need to be, just deal with what needs to be dealt with. As long as we keep our hands busy, we we seem to feel we can manage the problems that we're trying to avoid in life. If we keep ourselves busy, we don't have to think about it. But you see, none of that's going to change our spiritual condition inside. You're still the same you. You know you're living with you? You know what a lot of people do? They pack up, and go and live in another country. They could as well have stayed where they are because you're, leave, you're, you're living with yourself. The problem's you. There are people who go from one church to the next church, but you know, wherever you go, you're going to meet the same types of personalities because people are people. But the problem's not the people. The problem's you. The problem's you. If you don't deal with you, you can go somewhere else for a year or two and the people are going to have just the same because it ain't the people, it's you. 
Deal with it, deal with it, deal with it. In the name of Jesus, let's just deal with it. Stop all the work, stop all the moving around, stop all the, the sleepless nights. It says that Jacob was left alone, our text. And there he wrestled a man until the breaking of the day. We can all testify of sleep robbing us. Anxiety robbing us of sleep. We can all testify of that. But God intended night to bring sleep, rest, peace, rejuvenation. When we, when, we, when we lay down at night, we should sleep like a baby. How does a baby sleep? Without a care in the world. No matter what upsets a baby in the day. When a baby goes to sleep, the baby don't remember nothing. And God wants us like his children, his babies, to go to sleep in him and know that the blood of Jesus Christ has taken care of it all. Hallelujah. He's taken care of it all, all our past sins. He's taken care of. He's blotted them out, never to remember them anymore. So I say, Lord, just take your hand and wipe all of that from my memory. If you've forgotten it and you've forgiven me, then I let it go. I forgive myself. It doesn't exist anymore because if it's not in your book, then it means it does not exist. And then say, Lord, my life is in your hands. My future is in your hands. Tomorrow has not yet come. So I'm going to enjoy tonight the hours I have to sleep. I close my eyes in you, and I relax in you, and I will sleep the sleep of the righteous, and you've already gone into my future, and whatever presents itself tomorrow, you have already taken care of it all. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. So the remedy is I close for anxiety is first of all confession. And this is what Jacob did in <clears throat> verse 10 <clears throat> of but he did. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. For I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. I am not worthy. I'm not worthy of all the mercies and all the truth which you have shown yourself. We're not worthy of it at all, but God has made us worthy. We're a big mess, and we messed up big time. But let me tell you something now. I've messed up big time many a times, and I've asked for forgiveness. And if God's forgiven me and said I'm worthy, well, I am not arguing with God. It feels so good to know he's made me worthy. I'd rather stay in this place where he's made me worthy under his canopy of grace and have my sleep than to put myself in a place where I don't have to be and worrying and anxious. Petition. After sending the numerous messages and the countless gifts to Esau, Esau was... Jacob was still held captive. He'd, he'd give him all this stuff, but still he was held captive. Now he turned to, to the real remedy for anxiety, a prayerful petition to God. Let's read verses 11 and 12. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. <clears throat> for you said, I will surely treat you well, 
and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Oh, come on. He finally comes to his senses. He comes to his senses. senses, uh, senses he makes a, a petition to God. He should have done it from the very beginning. Lord, I'm anxious. I did this, I did that. But Lord, here I am. You made me a promise. You're going to bring this promise to pass. So Lord, I give my anxieties to you. I give all my fears to you. Because Lord, if this promise is going to come to pass, I've got to live. You give me this promise. I will surely treat you well and make your descendants as a sand of the sea which cannot be numbered for multitude. The same promise he gave to Abraham, he's given to him. And that's the remedy. Petition, talk to God. Prayerful petition to God. God will bring deliverance. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother. Pray for deliverance, and God will deliver you from yourself. Because God had already delivered him from Esau. He needs to be delivered from himself. Yeah. Claim the promises through your petition. Claim the promises of God. What Jacob did, he recalled or reclaimed the precious promises of God. Reclaim them. And what what that prayerful petition also does is leads, leads the way or helps us to abandon sin. We will leave our sin. He had no intention of continuing to be a supplanter. And then be persistent. Have persistent faith. And that persistent faith gives us confidence in God's protective power. Shall I give you Genesis 32, 20, or 32, 30? Yeah, then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. He wrestled. He was persistent. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. We've got to be persistent. You've given me a promise. I'm holding that promise. I messed up in my head. Uh, but Lord, I'm holding that promise. And now he said, I, he would not prevail against him. He touched the socket because Jacob would not let him go. The man had to get back to where he came from, and the day was breaking. He was in a hurry, but all night, Jacob held on. He wrestled with him. That, man, that, that, that messenger had to get back up the ladder, and Jacob wouldn't let him go. He couldn't get up the ladder, so he had to hit him in his hip. He said, I'm not going to let you go. And that messenger knew Jacob was not going to let him go. Until you bless me. What's your name? Jacob. Trickster. Supplanter. I change your name. They shall be Israel. The blessed of God. The precious one. He held on. And with the change of his name came the change of nature. Someone's got to do some wrestling today. Get a hold of the messenger of God and do some wrestling. I'm not going to let you go, God. You're giving me your blessing. You spoke your word over my life. The devil's a liar. I let go of anxiety. I let go of fear. I let go of lies. But God, I'm holding on to the promise. I'm holding on to the promise. And I will not let you go until you bless me. Ah. Deep confidence in God, faith in God brings confidence. Confidence in God brings trust and hope. And you're going to get everything 
that God says is yours. Escape your anxieties. Run from your anxieties. Run into the hands of Almighty God. If you're here, if you're here today and you're saying, God, that's me. I take my new beginning. Not one more moment am I going to torment myself. Not another moment. I am forgiven. I am a new creation. I have a new name. Risen up in heaven. In that book of life. I am a new creation. And from this day onwards, anxiety will not plague my life. I am a soldier in the army of God. I'm going through my boot camp. I'm going to be placed in my battalion. And Lord, when you send that signal, I'm out there on the battlefield. And you're going to fight with me. Shama Mashika. My family's coming in. My workmates are coming in. My neighbors are coming in. I recognize the battle. But God, I am not anxious because you've dealt with all my fears and all my anxieties. My faith is in you. My confidence is in you. My trust, my hope is in you. I am a winner. And I'm running for my life to escape anxiety. God bless you. Thank you.